now it comes. Dear Lord, how I have postponed many times describing this, the most painful part of my narrative. Not that the details are vague, far from it. The images in my mind are pin-sharp and all too hideously indelible. I venture, should all my memories slip away, tumbling like rubble down a slope as my life grows interminably longer and more brittle, this scene alone will remain. I even pull my dressing gown around my shoulders now, as I feel the icy chill of those walls upon my body. Imagine a gentleman's convenience with the dimensions of a palace. The same white tiles on every surface, the same overwhelming sibilance, the same residual smell of toxic substances masked by acrid disinfectant. We passed under pebbled glass gratings through which could be seen the feet of Parisians going about their daily work, oblivious to the macabre and poignant scenes below. Mentally, I urged the line to move faster. A woman up ahead was dabbing her eyes with a handkerchief, her backdrop a haze created by several hoses dousing the bodies. The cadaver of a large, hairy man, with half his head missing, silenced some dandies come for whatever perverse thrill they sought from the experience. If I was not sickened by that, I was sickened by what I saw next. For, amongst the dead, arranged with uniform indignity upon marble slabs, lay the flower girl's corpse. It knocked the air out of me, and Peter caught my elbow. What was most shocking was the exhibition of every inch of her pale, untarnished skin skin I had never touched, yet presented here for the entire public to see. Had she been touched? Had they touched her? Rage clouded my vision, but when the callous spout passed over her, spraying water and giving the illusion of movement across her flesh, I could bear it no longer. I dashed forward, plucking the strand of hair thrown into disarray over her face by the hose, for pity's sake, Sherlock. I shook my head vigorously, lifted her ice-cold hand to my lips. The moronic attendant shoved me back towards the line, barking that it was forbidden to touch the corpse. Le touche pas le cadavre. Le vous du cadavre. I felt another harsh prod against my chest and launched at him, and would have killed him, had not Olaf's tall frame stood separating us. The man backed away from my fiercely blazing eyes, and spat in a dream. It's time to go, said Peter softly. You need to sleep, and you need to get out of this damned awful place. My eyes were red raw, and I had no idea how much time, minutes or hours, had passed, and what had occupied them but my devastation. I was sitting on the floor near the foot of the slab with the rain from the hoses dripping down the walls. My dear fellow, I heard his brother's voice, Peter's right, there's nothing you can do. Go. Go if you want. Both of you. I'm going to stay. The next full hour I spent alone with my... How can I use the word? But I shall. 
often loved him. Presently the gas dipped lower, and I heard footsteps and the rattle of keys. It became apparent I was the last visitor in the place, and was compelled to tear myself in agony from her side. I walked leaden to the stairs, but once there, the terrible urge for one final glance overcame me. There was no doubt, but at first there had been only doubt. So unerringly, absolutely strange was the picture before me. A man, was it a man, stood over the bier. An elderly man with snow-white hair covering his ears, a pair of tinted pornsnay perched on the bridge of his nose, a black cape covering his entire frame, bent over the corpse, owlish head hovering but inches above her, as if smelling the bouquet of a fine wine. Toad-like, barrel-chested, and with spindly legs, he made no sound. There was no sound but that of the water from the hoses. His hands moved in alacritous gestures, almost those of a mesmerist. As I watched, dumbstruck, he went about his odious theatrics as if I were invisible. Was I invisible, and this a vile construction of my harried mind? If so, what did it mean? Why had I not seen him before, or heard his footfall? Immediately I hurried to the nearest morgue attendant, the one who had manhandled me. But no sooner had I caught his arm and turned to look back than I saw, open-mouthed, but the apparition was gone. Excusez-moi, l'homme au chavou blanc, I gabbled. L'homme qui te là-bas, habillé en noir, c'est qui? The morgue attendant looked entirely baffled. L'homme, monsieur. Oui, l'homme, les vieux avec les lunettes. The attendant looked over a second time and shook his head opening the iron gate for us both to exit. Je ne vous personne, he said. I have seen nobody.